All right, so I took some time and made some additional training data. Um, I've now saved that file, and I have um, some examples from my uh, five land cover categories here. Um, so right now I have, let's look at the table. I have a total of 120. It's probably not really enough, but again, this is just a demonstration, so that should be enough to at least uh, run the algorithm. So again, just some rules of thumb. Again, try to capture the variability in the class. Try to spread your training data out around your uh, map extent. Um, you know, make sure all the pixels within any um, any example is actually in that class. So that's just again some rules of thumb. Um, it's it's important to take the time to make the training data because that is generally one of the uh, most uh, important parts in terms of um, obtaining a decent classification accuracy. Okay, so I have an image and I have some training data, so now we should be ready to start to uh, train our algorithm. So uh, first off, I generated this data inside of a geo package, and I've had issues with being able to read geo package features into these uh, classification tools. I'm not sure if it's just my machine or if there's a, an, another reason, um, but I've had better luck with uh, shapefiles. So what I'm going to do is do an export here uh, to a shapefile. And we'll put it, let's see here. Yeah, let's see here. I don't know if I had, well, this will work. So we'll just call, we'll put it in this folder. We'll call it training prog.shape. And hit OK to run it. Again, make sure the projections matches. Okay, so to not have any confusion, I'm going to remove the original one. Okay, and then... Yeah, so there's all of our, our training data. We lost our symbology because I made a copy of it, but that's okay. All right, so we have our training set. So let me go now I'm into this compute image statistics. So this is generally required prior to running the algorithm. So we're going to do it for our input image, and it's going to get saved out to an XML file, so like extensible markup language. Um, and then I'm just going to put in the open here. We'll call it uh, prog stats, and then that's an XML file. And we'll run that tool. And how long this takes will generally just depend on uh, you know how big your image is, the number of bands, and so on and so forth. This actually has to go through and look at the distribution, the statistical distribution. All right, so looks like it finished. We didn't get any errors, um, so that should be available now. So we'll hit close there. So now we should be ready to actually train an algorithm. So what we're wanting to use here is train image classifier. So just to note some of the other options, we have train image regression. That's for if you're going to try to predict like a continuous variable. Um, so perform regression, we're doing classification. So that doesn't apply here. There's also train vector classifier and train vector regression. And what those do is it allows you to make predictions back to like points or lines or polygons. So you're effectively using features in the attribute table as your predictor variables and your, um, and your dependent variable. Um, so one good use of that would be if you were going to do like an object-based classification. You could try to you classify the objects um, using the, the vector um, tools there. So we're doing pixels, so we want to do images. So I'm going to just go to this train image regret or image classifier. And this opens up the tool to build your classifier. So the first thing we knew is that need to do is input an image and hit OK there. So it's, that's just our prog image, and by default it should use all the bands that are in the stack. So this is a red, green, blue, near infrared, four band stack. Then we want to grab our training samples. Um, sometimes I've had issues where it doesn't seem to want to read it from the layers, and I'm not really sure why that is. So actually just to be safe, I'm going to go into the folder where I, where I save that and just grab it directly from the folder. Um, and again, you may not have similar, you may not have these issues, but this is something, I, I'm not, again, I'm not really sure uh, if it's a, an issue with my machine specifically or, or something else. Hard time finding this. Let me 
real quick just go in properties and make sure I know where it is information QGIS demos oh, okay I was on the wrong drive so um, we'll go to add files again and I'm gonna go to the correct folder teaching demos and it should be in here so there's your there it is again shape files are multiple parts so you just grab the dot shape part bring it in okay and then we want to get rid of that one okay so that's reading it's the same thing was reading it from the directory as opposed to from the layer file because again I've had issues with that then you want to feed it in the stats file which I believe um, that's the model stats. Let me see here. C teaching demos. Probably should have been more organized with this. Maybe it wasn't my other drive. So we'll go in there. And I believe it was, I'm actually not finding it. Let me, uh, this is actually a uh, way you can, you go up to history, you can look at tools you've ran, and so there's where I saved it. So it was prog stats, QJS demo. Um, that's a nice way to look for where your outputs ended up or just to rerun a tool without having to fill it all back in. Um, so according to this, this should be in um, C, teaching, GS demos, and then there should be a prog stats file in here. Prog stats XML, there it is. Okay, so we've got our input set. Um, then uh, we just have other training settings. So maximum training sample size per class. That This means it won't go over 1,000. We don't even have 1,000 samples, so... We'll just leave the default. And then this is for the validation set. And then bound sample number by minimum. So it has to have at least one sample or it's not going to classify that class. That makes sense. This trending and validation sampling ratio, that's basically how much of the data will be withhold to validate the model. Generally, you can't validate on your training data because it overfits a little. So that would be biased. Um, I wanted to use more training than validation, so I'm just going to pop it up to like 0.7. So it should be 70% training and withhold 30% for validation. Note that this is flawed because I didn't collect like random samples. They were you know hand selected. So that would really bias your error assessment. But um, it's I mean it's it's at least useful to get a get a broad sense of how well it did. But um, that wouldn't be like suitable for like a rigorous assessment unless it was a randomized data set. And then this is the field that is the class code as an integer. Remember, we did integers as opposed to text. So that's that class field. And I believe you have to put it in quotes. Um, then you could also input a DM, a geoid. We don't really need to do any of that stuff. And this is a key setting. So there's different algorithms available here. So we've got like a boosting method, a decision trees, artificial neural networks, a Bayes classifier, random forests. K nearest neighbor. Um, so, yeah. Um, what I'm going to do initially is this lib SVM, which is a support vector machine classifier. And then we'll set a few settings specific to it. So, this SVM kernel type, that's um, how it's going to transform the data into a hyper uh, hyperspace. So, we're going to use a RBF, a radial basis function for that. This is the type, numeric, one class, and this is class multi-class well, that's what we're doing and then this um, these are what we call hyperparameters there are algorithm settings that are used to define they can input the output or, or uh, impact the output <laughs> so uh, generally it's not always easy to know what to use there are methods for like trying to optimize those um, there's opt there's methods built into this for doing that specifically um, that generally takes a long time because it has to test a lot of values. So we're not going to run that here, but note that there are options for trying to optimize the hyperparameters. And then you can set a random seed. That can be useful for things like reproducibility. Um, and then what it's going to produce is not an, it's, is, is a, a model file and then a, an error matrix. So we go to save to file. 
um, I always forget what file. I think they're text files, but if that does it, if you're not sure, um, if you just put like dot file, it'll it'll read it correctly, at least within QGIS. Um, I'm pretty sure this is actually a text, so we'll do um, we'll just do SVM QGMatrix dot text. Okay, so that's going to save our outputs into that teaching G QGS demos folder. So before we run it, let's just have a look. Make sure, so we have an image input. We have our vector layer coming in. We didn't provide any validation data because we're just going to use a subset of the training data. Again, it's biased, but it's just demonstration. Um, bring in the stats, the training parameters, the split, the field that defines the classes. And then we ha we're using our S support vector machine classifier with radial basis function, and we just set left the default cost param or the default hybrid parameters, and we're not going to optimize them. And then we're having our outputs actually saved to disk. Okay, so let's run this and see what happens. So note at this point, you're not actually like classifying the image; you're just generating a model. Um, so once the model is generated, then you can apply it to an image or even a new image. Um, to perform the, the classification. Um, so that we'll do in a separate video. Okay, so that looks like it finished. So we have execution completed. Um, didn't take too long to run. So let's just close that. Note nothing got brought in because it didn't generate like any image output. So let's go into that folder where we save those files. So that was teaching. Uh, QGIS demos, and somewhere in here we should have this um, these SVM outputs. Let's see where we saved it, right? Oh, here we go. There's the model file, and this is the confusion matrix. So let's open the confusion matrix and see what it looks like. I'm going to try Notepad, see what it looks like there. Okay, so this isn't super easy to read, but let me see. Let me try it in Notepad instead. Okay, so this is the confusion matrix. So this is the diagonal, and, they, and it's by pixels within the polygons. That's why the numbers are so large. So we got our class codes, and then the diagonal are correct, and the off diagonals are wrong. So we can look at this to try to get a sense of like where the error is at. What I'm going to do. Um, is I'm going to open this with Excel and try to make a clean table out of it. So I'm going to do uh, open and browse and we're going to go to our C drive again just to that folder and let me yeah, we'll have to ha we're looking for text files. There we go and then open. And I believe it looks like it's comma separated. So we'll do that. So we'll do delimited, next, comma, next, finish. Okay. These are kind of weird, but we'll remove that. Um, this should be one. And I'm going to add another field in here insert. So this is one, two, three, four, five. And just to make things a little easier to understand, let's actually just give them names. So our class one was water. Our class two was lo like low veg, we'll call it open. And our three was soil, and four was developed. And last one was uh, forest. And then we can copy those over into this with like a transpose. Let's see if we got an option to transpose. There we go. So now we have an error matrix. It's a little easier to understand. So if you if you haven't looked at an error matrix before, and I'll just make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. I said it'd be under view probably zoom. We'll do two hundred percent. All right, there we go. So. Looks like there there was none of the water category uh, pixels were misclassified, which was good. It looks like there was some confusion between soil, um, 
uh, soil, bare soil, and like fields, which kind of makes sense because you have a lot of the fields that are kind of in the middle where they're like sparsely vegetated or you know uh, partially fallow or something. So that kind of, that area makes sense. Uh, we've got some confusion between development and soil. Again, they're kind of spectrally bright, so that makes sense. Uh, forest, we did a pretty good job according to this. Um, there's some confusion between like uh, open uh, soil and open and soil and development. Again, we looked at that already. So this looks fairly promising. Um, if we wanted to get like a percent correct, we could do equal to the sum. We'll just grab the sum of the diagonal. So these are the correct ones. And then we'll divide that by the sum of the entire table. So it was like 98%. Again, that's overly optimistic because, um, again, we didn't do random samples and there's autocorrelation issues because there are pixels within the same polygons and whatnot. So um, in short, that should uh, that's that's not a rigorous assessment, but it does give you a sense of where the confusions lie and a kind of a broad understanding of your uh, accuracy. Okay, so we'll end this video here, and then in the next video, we'll actually apply our model to, to the image to get a wall-to-wall -wall, uh, classification.